Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Good morning. It is good to be again in the house of our God. Welcome to Old Town Heritage Church. Uh, Before we begin properly, are there any announcements? Short meeting after church church, uh, to look over my contract, apparently. All right. Choir practice resumes in the fall. Uh, Sunday's at 6. I I talked to Terry. She's not going to be able to make it. Do we want to do that tonight? Yep, okay. So we will do Sunday's at 6 tonight. And you are all welcome to come. Um, If there aren't any other announcements then. Let's go to worship. Uh, Let's turn to page uh, 657. Uh, We'll sing uh, twice through This is the Day. Now let's turn to page 155. We'll sing all verses of All Hail the Power.
from 154. <laughs> I'm sorry. While we remain standing, let's turn to our responsive reading on the bulletin insert and also on the slides. Uh, please recite with me. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teachings drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We have special music this morning. We do not, but July and August is so. Okay. Uh, no special music this morning. Uh, lots throughout July and August. Now we come to our prayer and share time. If anyone has any prayer requests or praise reports, let us make them known. I, I have a praise report. Um, last night, Becky, we just signed a card for. She had surgery on some melanoma in her ear, Becky E. Bright. She called last night and said to tell everyone here, she opened the card and smiled at everybody's name and it made her day. And she said to praise the Lord here this morning. They didn't have to go in the second time on Wednesday. They got everything on Monday. So she thanked us for the card and, and our prayers when she said that to our God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Any others? Terry. Okay, we will pray for Steve. Terry. something about it. 
Yeah, I've talked to other pastors about uh, about churches, and people often, you know, get embarrassed when when your baby cries during church. Um, but that's the sound of life. Um, that's 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 the sound of a church that's alive and and growing. Uh, the first church that I pastored, I was there for five years from uh, 2013 to 2019. When we uh, finally closed, uh, we had four people in the pews. Um, one lady and her three elderly daughters. Um, we just couldn't, couldn't continue. Uh, that church had been around since 1890. Um, so, yeah, we, we need to be about the business of, of the church. Are there any, any other prayer requests or praise reports? We do, have another, another young we do. We do. Isaac has been coming, and I'm very grateful for that. Yes, Heather. I saw some of the, the marching 110 picks, and I was so jealous. <laughs> right. Okay. Any other prayer requests or praise reports? Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll pray for Janice and Ralph. Yes. Okay. Woody. Okay, how's she doing? Pretty good, actually, but keep praying. Good, glad to hear. Any others? If not, let's go before the throne. <clears throat> Blessed and holy Lord, you who are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray, this morning we come to you in worship. You are our God, and we are the flock that you shepherd. Let us be about you and you alone, and let this time of worship and celebration be only ever and always unto you. Righteous Master, as we bow in your presence, we shrink before your majesty. We gaze in wild wonder on the works of your hands. We consider with mounting awe the deeds of your Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Blessed Yehovah, we stand amazed with the burning angels around your throne and the saints gathered within your court, and we join in the ever-increasing and unending chorus of holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Worthy are you to take the scrolls and to open its seals, 
For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Father Yehovah, may all that we say and do here be to your glory, that we, your church, may fulfill our right and noble calling of bringing honor to your holy name. Blessed Father, we have sinned against heaven and against our fellow men. We have done those things we should not have done, and we have left undone those things which we should have accomplished, and there is no peace within us. But Lord, you tell us in your holy scriptures that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful, that you are just, that you will forgive us of our trespasses and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, blessed Lord, in these next few moments, in this holy place, in this sacred space of time, in the privacy of our own hearts, we make our confession before you. And so, blessed Lord, through our confession and through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are truly forgiven. It is marvelous in our sight. And now, Father, as a righteous and a redeemed people, we stand before you. We lift before you, Father, those requests we have spoken this morning. We lift also before you those we have kept hidden in our hearts. Lord, where there is need of peace or safety, healing or forgiveness, strength or security, we know that you are the wonderful counselor. You are the great physician. You are the good shepherd. You are the mighty God. There is none who compare to you, Lord. Help us to trust you with our pain and our fear. Lord, help us to trust you and to walk humbly before you. Father, in this dark and dangerous time, we pray for your intervention in our world. Lord, let those who war against one another lift their eyes and behold your glory. Let the striving and the dying to cease, and let the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ, reign over every mountain and valley, every river and sea, every city and village. Lord, let the gospel of Jesus Christ go forth from Jerusalem and from Frankfurt, and let souls be won and lives changed forever to the glory of your holy name. Lord, teach us to truly love one another as you have loved us. Finally, Father, we ask your blessing on Old Town Heritage Church, on the building, on the premises, on the people in the pews, Lord. We ask that you would use us and strengthen us to do the good work of your kingdom. Lord, we ask that you would bring into our lives and into our sanctuary those who need to hear the gospel of Christ, and that when you do, Lord, you would give us the wisdom and the courage to speak it. And now, Father, as we go into the remainder of our service, we ask that you would be with us. We ask, Lord, that you would open our ears and loose our tongues and soften our hearts, that we might know and hear and speak the wonderful, holy truths 
of your scripture. These things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, who himself has taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask a couple of ushers to come forward, please, to receive the offering. Thank you. All right. And now, if you would please, let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, and verse 16. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, and verse 16. Once you've found the place, uh, uh, if you're able, please let us rise for the reading of Scripture. Matthew 28 and 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped. They worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed and holy Lord, in these next few moments, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you. May you teach your people the message you would have them to hear. That above all things, Father, your name would be glorified. It is in the blessed name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Verse 16 of the 28th chapter of Matthew tells us something interesting. It tells us that the disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now, this could possibly be Mount Arbel or the Horns of Hatim, both of which are in that region and have beautiful views of the lake. The Horns of Hatim is a very likely spot for the Sermon on the Mount, and Mount Arbel is the highest spot in the region. We can guess at this spot, but the exact spot isn't as important as the region we know they went to the Galilee. Now, the easiest route from Jerusalem to the Galilee would be to walk northwest to the Jordan Valley and then up the Jordan, a total distance of 156 kilometers or 97 miles. Google Maps said it would take 33 hours to walk that distance. If you walked for 12 hours a day, it would take you three days to get there. You'd arrive in the evening and you would arrive tired. Now, let's look at the time. See, Jesus is resurrected on the first day of the week, that is, on Sunday. On that day, he appears to Mary and to some of the disciples in the upper room and to two of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, somewhere a few miles west or northwest of Jerusalem. Nobody really knows for sure where that happened. But eight days later, he appears again, and this time Thomas is there. Jesus proves to Thomas that he's real. Put your fingers here, put your hand here. Here, do not disbelieve, but believe. Now, by any reckoning, we are eight days out from the crucifixion. Jesus has been alive again for just over a week, and we've only got 40 days with him, beloved. We've only got 40 days after his his resurrection, and eight of those are past. Then, he tells the disciples to meet him in Galilee, and he disappears. And remember... Galilee is 97 miles to the north. So the apostles take off, and and they go there in a hurry. Why do they go there? Because the master said to. No other reason. They don't need to go on a shopping trip. They don't need to go see family. They went because the master said to. Say this with me, church. Because the master said to. Now, John tells us in chapter 21 that the disciples went to the Galilee. Simon, Peter, Thomas, who was called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee, and two others. Seven apostles in total. But Jesus doesn't appear to them right away. These seven apostles have just walked 97 miles, and and Jesus doesn't show up when they get there. And... So they wait. And they wait. And they wait. And we have no idea how long they wait, but we know that however long it is, it's long enough for them to get bored. So in John 21 and 3, we read, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And then, then in the morning, we have that beautiful story where Jesus reinstates Peter. Listen, church, we don't have a whole lot of time. Let me tell you, Jesus cooks breakfast for them. He has baked bread and roasted fish over a fire while they were on the lake. And when they come in, Jesus feeds them. They, they eat together. Blessed be the name of the Lord. They eat together just like Moses and Aaron and the 72 elders did in Exodus 24. When they meet with God on Sinai, Jesus eats with them. Now, pardon the interruption, but do you know what it means in the Middle East to eat with someone? In those ancient times, when two kings were at war and one knew he was losing, it was a valid tactic of him to attempt to sneak under the tent flap of of the opposing king, not to kill him, but to eat a bite of bread from his table. You see, if he could snatch a bite of bread and get it into his mouth before his soldiers killed him, the war was over. Eating a meal with your enemy brings peace 
And now, now, beloved, the apostles know. Now, after the resurrection, they have no doubt. They're absolutely sure that this is God sitting here on the shore, baking bread and roasting fish. It happens again. Just like with Moses and the elders, they eat with God. And Jesus talks to Peter. In John 21, we read this. When they had finished, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And in the English, it's a little confusing. I had a college professor tell me nobody understands this passage. It doesn't make any sense. It's just one of those random things that some... That, that, that somebody, not John, of course, anybody but John, but somebody wrote in without having any meaning. But in the Greek, it's crystal clear. See, there are two different words which get translated as love, and they are of the utmost import to understanding this passage. Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you agapau me? Agapau is the word that Jesus uses. The master uses that, and it means perfect or divine or holy love. It's the kind of love with which God loves us. And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Phileo, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Lord, I don't agapau you, I phileo you. And even though he has done this, the master says, feed my sheep. Then Jesus says it again. Do you love me with a divine, perfect, holy love? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you like a brother. And even though he has done this, the master says, feed my sheep. And the third time, beloved, the third time Jesus speaks to Peter, he changes it. He says, Peter, do you phileo me? Peter, do you love me like a brother? And Peter... God bless him. Peter begins weeping because he sees that Jesus changes it. He sees that Jesus has come down to his level. Jesus said, phileo, and Peter realizes that his heart is broken. He is sinful. He is less than he should be. He is not what the master said he should be. And Peter is overcome with emotion, and Peter begins weeping. Peter realizes that he is unworthy, that he has denied, that he has sinned against Jesus, that he has broken the master's heart, and that he's just not good enough. He's not good enough, and he knows it. He's not good enough. He's not even capable of being good enough to be what the master has called him to be. And even though he has done this, beloved, even though he has done this, Jesus says, feed My sheep. Do you see? Do you see that even in this moment, Jesus forgives Peter? Even Peter, who betrayed him, Jesus forgives. And I look into my own heart. I look at my own life. I look at the mess I have made of everything God has given me. And even though I have done these horrible things, beloved, the Lord says to me, feed my sheep. Beloved, if God can forgive me, if God can forgive Peter, then there's nothing you can do There's nothing you have done to drive him away. Nothing. You are here this morning because God wants you here 
You are here this morning because in his divine plan, he has ordained you here. Now, maybe he wants you to hear me. Maybe he wants you to touch your neighbor. Maybe he called you to walk 97 miles from wherever you were to wherever you are. And you came, beloved, because the master said to say this with me, because the master said to. So Jesus reinstates Peter and sets him back on his feet. And then Jesus prophesies for Peter and he says, Peter, you're going to die a horrible, miserable death. It doesn't matter. Follow me. And Peter, who realizes that he's just been forgiven of abandoning. He's been forgiven of abandoning Jesus to save his own skin. Right here, Peter realizes the power of this forgiveness. And it's the one thing he's never experienced that is worth dying for. Standing on the Sea of Galilee, Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and he plunges into the water. But here, on the shore of that same sea, from this moment forward, Peter's eyes never leave Jesus. Legends tell us that some years later, Peter is forced to watch his own wife crucified as torture. And he stands there, bound hand and foot at her cross, yelling, Oh, thou beloved, remember Christ. He doesn't run. He doesn't deny. Never again does Peter say, I never knew the man. In this terrible moment, he says, that man is the only thing worth remembering. That man is the only thing worth more than the life of my family, more than the life of my beloved, more than my own life. He says, oh, thou beloved, remember Christ. So the disciples on the shore, they eat breakfast and they go for a walk. And Matthew tells us in our primary text, they went to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him there, they bowed down and they worshiped him. And while they were worshiping, the master said this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son And of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Repeat after me. Go, therefore. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded. Go, disciple, baptize, teach. And right now, I should be looking for a sermon illustration. I should be looking through newspapers or one of my books to find some story to tell you about some guy who did what the master said to do and how they were blessed or changed by it, how it changed the world. Some story of of John Wesley or Martin Luther King Jr. or George Washington or maybe one of the saints, but I don't even have to do that. Because right now, here we are, beloved, in the middle of the greatest sermon illustration ever. Jesus tells them, go, disciple, baptize, teach. And he tells them, now meet me in Jerusalem. And he disappears. Listen, Jesus tells them to walk 97 miles to the south. And you know what we don't read in the scriptures? We don't hear the apostles groan or grumble. We don't hear it because they didn't do it. They, the master said, go to Jerusalem. They're going back to Jerusalem. They walk back down the river 97 miles because the master said to. Say this with me, church. Because the master said to. Go, disciple, baptize, teach. The master said to. And they walk. They walk through the desert. They walk down the Jordan River Valley. They walk all day long like their ancestors leaving Egypt. They walk and they walk. Three, four, five days later, they come to Jerusalem. And there, there they find the master. One last time. Only Luke records it. In chapter 24 of Luke's gospel, beginning at the 50th verse, we read, And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. 
While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Now, Bethany, we've spoken of it before. Bethany is a little town just across the Hinnom Valley from Jerusalem. Today, it's part of modern day Jerusalem. But even in that day, it was a short walk from the city, except the apostles weren't coming from the city. They were coming from the Galilee, 97 miles to the north. And we don't hear them complain because now, beloved, now they know who he is. The great question of Mark 8, the great question of Matthew 16 has been answered. Yes, he's Messiah, but they worship him because he's more than Messiah. They worship him because he is the incarnate deity. He is God. Come down, God with us. He came to die that justice might be fulfilled. He came to rise again that righteousness might be fulfilled, that death might be defeated, that our loss, our pain, our sorrows, our tears might be swallowed up in joy. That the joy of the Lord would be our strength. The joy of the Lord, our salvation, would fill us and that we might know him, the one true God And that a way might be made for us to eat at his table, not as enemies, not as slaves, but just as the master says in John 15 and 15, as friends. That hostilities between God and man would cease, that Eden would be restored, that the world would be set right again, and that Jesus would rule over all. Beloved, they worshipped him when he had ascended into heaven. They returned to Jerusalem with great Joy. They did not mourn his loss after they did at his death a mere 43 days ago, but they returned with great joy because when he died, they thought he had left them. But now they see the truth of his words. He promised he would stay, and he did. Behold, he says, I'm with you always to the very end of the age, and they were not abandoned. They were not alone. Even though they saw him taken up, they were not alone because it was just as he said. He would always be with them. So what? What do you do with that? I haven't told you anything new. I haven't given you any great insights. What are you supposed to do with this? You go. When the road is long, when you're going in circles, when the sun is hot, when it's 97 miles to Jerusalem and you were just there last week, you go. And when you go, you disciple. Now, what's the difference between telling someone about Jesus and discipling them? When you disciple them, you walk with them. You walk that path of faith. You don't put in 20 minutes And then go away. You sit and you talk. You spend time over the days and the weeks and the months and the years. You disciple others like Jesus discipled the twelve. By investing your time, your talents, and your love in them. And when you go, you disciple, you baptize. And when I say baptize, I don't just mean dunking someone in water. Although that is certainly a part of it. No, I mean you wash them with the word. You bathe them in prayer. You share your heart. You share your spirit with them. You baptize them with the fire of the Holy Spirit in love, in patience, in gentleness, in respect. You baptize them. You go, you baptize, you, dis- you disciple, you baptize, and you teach. And while you are baptizing them, you teach them these things. You teach them what Jesus has said. You teach them what Jesus has done. You share with them what he has said and done for you. And you teach them what you have been taught. Beloved, you go, you disciple, you baptize, you teach. Even when it's hard. Even when the road is long. Even when there's trouble. Even when there's heartache. Even when there's loss. Even when you feel alone. Even when you feel forsaken You do it. You do it because you're never alone. You do it because you have not been forsaken. The master is with you always, even to the very end of the age. And this, dearly beloved, this is the love of God. 
that you love one another as he has loved you. That you see the people around you as being made in his holy image, as being image bearers of the imago dei, of, the, of, of God, of all creation. And that you love him who has done this for you. Because what's another way to say go, disciple, baptize, and teach? That is love. If you love them, you will go to them. If you love them, you will disciple them. If you love them, you will baptize them and teach them all of the things that Christ has taught you. Moses and Paul agree. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Go. Disciple. Baptize. Teach. Love one another. Because the master said to. Amen. Let's bow our hearts. Father, may you teach us to live the Great Commission. May we bind it on our foreheads and on our wrists. May we bind it on the doorposts of our house. May we speak of it when we rise and when we lie down. May we teach our children. May you make us people of the Great Commission that we would bring glory to your name and love one another as you have loved us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Let's turn on our hymnals, please, to page 155. No. Nope, I'm sorry. 57. 57, thank you. I'm sorry. 157. Just 57. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Page, page 57. O for a thousand tongues. One, two, three, six, seven. Uh, one, two, three, and seven. Okay.
Our master has called us to disciple. Our master has called us to baptize. Our master has called us to teach. Let us go and do. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.